All right, so we're recording now for the Esoteric Book Club on June 13th, and we're going to go over Calcination, Chapter 10, and, or 11, and then Dissolution, Chapter 12. Uh, but we were just talking about our own personal experiences that we were having with calcination kind of lightly before we get in um, to the book club discussion. And um, the, we were talking about how astrologically Mars and Cancer is a beautiful expression of that dissolution process, which requires fire and water to burn away deep-rooted emotional upsets, which goes in line with the interpretation of Mars and Cancer as well which is Cancer's lineage, family, where you come from, your sense of belonging or security, the land, the literal, like physical land that you come from, your country of origin. And Mars being in Cancer, which is the United States sun sign, um, shows that there's a lot of um, potential calcination that's happening right now with a lot of people, a lot of potential dissolution, and then a lot of potential crystallization or hardening of the pain and suffering that should be coming up. So like there should be way more temper tantrums <laughs> everywhere. John Stewart did a really beautiful, eloquent one. Uh, if you saw that recently, his getting um, pretty heated about Congress not showing up to his 9-11 um uh, getting funds for 9-11 first responders so that they can have health care um and have all their bills paid for because a lot of them have cancer and whatnot but he had a really nice little tantrum about that it was great he is a beautiful tantrum really i'd like to see his tantrum more than anyone else i read about it but i didn't see it i'll have to google that afterwards it's great. It's probably a really great example of Mars and Cancer. Cool. That moment. Um, he gets red in the face. He starts to get really agitated and irritated and like kind of tears up here and there. And talking about not just for him, for to take care of other people, other people that were heroes, which is Mars, right? Um, and Mars and Cancer is very protective of just in general, very protective energy, very protective of emotions, um, and can anger easily. So I think Mars and Cancer was on his side. I'd like to look at his chart and see if it was making a nice aspect to some of his like personal planets, possibly Mercury or even his sun. Um, but we were talking about the eclipse that's going to happen on July 2nd. Um, because it's in Cancer at 10 degrees, um, and it's right on, actually, it's right on the um, United States Sibley chart, and I can share the screen so we can talk about um, general transits and what's happening currently. Um, so, this is, this might be a little complicated. We'll just look at the sky now. This is what's happening. So when we first started looking at the astrological chart for the sky now, the sun at seven o'clock was just on the horizon line. And now that the days are getting longer, the sun at 718 even is pretty far above the horizon line. Um, at about almost like seven to eight degrees. So until we get to cancer season, which is the longest day of the year, um, marks the summer season for us on the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the sun will continue to stay out later, just general astronomical factoids. But it's just nice to keep that in mind to orient yourself in the actual physical space that we live in because 
we can sometimes get really mercurial and heady and forget that the planets are actually existing and moving around us. Um, so currently the sun is just about to set. It still has maybe, maybe like about 40 minutes left actually till it hits that descendant line. Um, <clears throat> and then the moon was, is coming out of a quarter uh, moon. Um, we had the, what was it, the new moon recently. Uh, what day was it? Was it the third? Is it June? <laughs> oh yeah, it's June. And then our next full moon will be in Sagittarius on the 17th. So it'll be, the moon will be over here. It's coming down into Sag. Um, Jupiter is still retrograde until September. You can look at the ephemeris to see um, a little bit more clearly where these planets are going. So, like, I don't even really look at the ephemeris that much, but it is nice to see the actual, just like take a scroll down the column and see, oh, okay, so the 19th, the North Node will be, will be out of retrograde for a few days. Um, you can see uh, the Sun entered, or the Venus entered Gemini not too long ago on the 9th. This is, this is today, this gray line. And what else happened recently? Um, we just moved into Scorpio for today, the moon in Scorpio. So it's a great time to talk about deep shit <laughs> that we went through from yeah, last week. Mars Neptune trying today too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, you mentioned that. So you can see it here very clearly, the Neptune in Pisces, it's a water trine. So um, with cardinal, with Mars in a cardinal sign, so there is activity happening that's not all just imaginary. Um, how do you feel about Mars and Neptune trying exact? I keep thinking of that book that you, um, I think it's in the book that you recommended to me, but I haven't read it in a while, so I forget exactly what it said, but um, that Cycles of Opportunity book, Oh yeah. Um, which is all mostly pulled from esoteric astrology, Al Alice Bailey, right? So I was kind of reading those together when I was reading them, and that was a while ago. I haven't gone back to that. But there's something about Mars and Neptune um, in the higher octaves that they are both, I think, on the sixth ray together, so, like both Mars and Neptune. And so when they are in like aspects to each other when they finally sync up especially in like trying type energy it's supposed to create that ray basically what that ray represents um so that might be something that we want to go back to and look at um just because i find that really that kind of stuff fascinating about all the esoteric astrology so but i have neptune and mars actually in a trine in my chart but they're in earth signs not water signs. So I feel like as somebody that has these planets kind of working together, um, and so I, I'm a very like musical person and artistic person. And so I kind of, when I think about that energy, I think of us being in, in a place where we're able to really pull from that more like ethereal unseen world and take what we're kind of channeling, especially in the water signs like Pisces and Cancer and uh, you know, like you were talking about um, temper tantrums and like John Stewart asserting his emotions in that way. It's like we kind of have that access to everything and then that outpour to like kind of assert it is is helping. I think some people that have strong Neptune placements, it like kind of gets you lost, you know, it's like the illusion or like the swimming, whereas Mars kind of helps direct that energy. So I feel like it, it probably feels really nice for a lot of people to maybe have kind of like 
somewhere they're directing that energy right now versus it just being in more of a drowny feeling. But Jupiter's in the mix with that square, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is just going to be kind of dependent on how it's affecting personal, you know, people in that way. I just think it's an inspiring time. I think that uh, this is an opportunity for a lot of growth for a lot of people and that there's really an opportunity to kind of do something with it right now in a way that maybe is new, you know, maybe there's something that you haven't really seen clearly about yourself or your situation and the Jupiter Neptune square is kind of forcing you into this place to really grow and expand and that knowledge of the world and of yourself and Mars is kind of coming in to amplify that healing process or like push it you know into a new direction so mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know it's interesting I feel like um, when I was looking at this week's forecast and then thinking of it in relation to our book, I was definitely kind of blown away, like how in line that stuff was. And I, I, I always see the forecast when I write them, like, you know, happening before me, like I'll kind of see it. But when I, like I, when I write something and then I see how many other people are saying the same thing and identifying in the same way and as a collective, which is very Neptune, like. Neptune to me represents a lot of the collective, even though it's uh, more subconscious. It's still like the collective unconscious or something. I just feel like we're seeing all of us kind of go through this in some way this week. Like, I just feel like everyone's kind of talking about their healing process along the Mars Neptune theme. So, mm -hmm. it's interesting to watch. I don't know. I feel like I'm just rambling. No, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this week I was getting a lot of, and because we do readings and Lacey, I'm sure you have a lot of reflections in the same way, which we'll talk about in the Emerald Tablet book, but um, like that you give the reflection through your clients very directly what is happening energetically in the, in the stratosphere, but also with you what's happening internally with you as a reader personally. And um, that's being reflected out into this person that's sitting in front of you, which sounds really self-centered and selfish. And as a Libra, <laughs> I, there's, a, there's parts of um, esotericism, the occult and magic that I'm overcoming in my own self, which is this like, you know, sense that Yes, the world is being reflected back to me in my own image rather than me reflecting other people for them. And so um, doing readings this past, these past couple of weeks with this very heavy Capricorn cancer uh, polar or duality has been showing up as kind of... Um, this more connection to uh, your ethnicity, I suppose, or who you are culturally. What is your identifier as a, if there's a lot of us who are children of immigrants, who are first, second generation, who are now at this point where terms such as um, like non-binary, with genders coming up, um, illegal immigration, illegal immigrants, immigrant, American, um, Asian, what's Asian American? Is it just an American or is it like an Asian American? And then is that even furthering the polarity in itself with that identifier as being a hyphen? Like, am I a hyphenated? I, like, what is my, who, what is your orientation to the country that you live in? is what I've been getting from a lot of my readings this past couple of weeks. Um, and Annalisa, you were saying that this for this month in your tarot pool, you got the emperor reversed, which is a really fascinating connection. I'm assuming that's directly connected to Saturn's conjunct the south node mm. in Capricorn with Pluto there, all retrograde. Yeah. Um, so, 
Let's see. Lacey, I know you're driving and I know you said you weren't going to talk much, but did you want to add anything to that? I don't know if you muted yourself. If not, that's fine. Um, so, okay, we didn't meet two weeks ago. We Last time we met was a month ago, which was just before the Scorpio full moon. And um, would have been a really great time to do the calcination exercise in the book, but if not, that's fine too, because it all is in divine timing. But in chapter 11, so we're just going to go into it. Um, going into the esoteric book club. So I realized that I hadn't really fully read the Emerald Tablet maybe more than a couple times this whole time that we've been reading the book. So I just wanted to take a moment to re- connect with the full script that we've been diving into. Um, Tis true without lying, certain and most true. That which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that is below. To do the miracles of one thing, of only one thing, and as all things have been and arose from one by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing by adaptation. The sun is its father, the moon its mother, the wind hath carried it in its belly, the earth is its nurse. The father of all perfection in the whole world is here. Its force or power is entire if it be converted into earth. Separate thou the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, sweetly with great industry. It ascends from the earth to the heaven and again it descends to the earth and receives the force of things superior and inferior. By this means you shall have the glory of the whole world, and thereby all obscurity shall fly from you. Its force is above all force, for it vanquishes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. So was, so was ye world created. From this are and do come admirable adaptations, where the means is here in this. Hence I am called Hermes Trismegistus, Trismegist, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. That which I have said of the operation of the sun is accomplished and ended. And then here's a little um, illustration of that. And then the Latin text. So we have been talking about these three stanzas where calcination in chapter 11 is represented by the stanza, the sun is its father. So, you know, obviously at this point we're working with fire, with calcination, burning it down. The calcination in the uh, Emerald Tablet book that Dennis talks about for his own personal calcination is really fascinating. Um, and it makes sense now that he would have used William Shatner for one of his examples because of his connection to ufology and being the founding editor for the MUFON UFO journal, which is pretty amazing. This guy was a mathematician. Um, his, the first part of his life. So his identity was heavily, um, connected to logic and intelligence. He went into math thinking that he was going to find God, essentially, find the secrets of the universe. And he, when he came to realize that he was being kind of like uh, e egotistical in that endeavor, that you could even find God in math and only math and that that's the only thing that you'd be able to find it in was kind of like short-sighted of him but still so he continued on with his um education in math until he had a ski trip where he saw a ufo 
And that ended up being the beginning process of his calcination. Uh, because seeing this UFO really put a huge kind of wrench in all of his mathematical expertise at that point. Um, because in order to accept the fact that he saw a UFO, he would have to accept that he had not actually uncovered the secrets of the universe in math and math alone in his limited viewpoint because the UFO that he saw defied gravity, it defied all of the um, mathematical equations that would make up our universe that he knew it. And so part of him wanted to ignore it that he never even saw anything because if he realized that he saw it, then he would have to come to terms with the fact that everything that he had been learning up to that point was not holistic. Um, and that there were holes in the information. So he went into ufology, became, founded MUFON, uh, the MUFON journal. I don't know if he founded MUFON itself, but the journal. And um, rose to the top in that field, um, taught, you know, knew all of the like head people. And this is in the 70s. So UFOlogy was really big then. It's coming back, which as we're familiar with at this point, everything from the 60s and the 70s is coming back now. Um, but so he did all of his UFOlogy work in the 70s. And then um, he had a fit, he had a little issue with his publisher realizing that the publisher was manipulating the public into believing things that weren't true. And he really was a true skeptic of ufology where he didn't just take anything at face value, but really tried to find the truth and whether things were real he they wouldn't publish anything that they thought was fake or like national Enquirer style but um the publisher ran ran an article that was totally made up and um so there was a there was an issue between the two of them he got fired he got let go he went down into the dark night of, this, of his own soul, which was basically being cast out of the society that he had helped fund, uh, create, and went into the desert of Nevada and started mining gold, <laughs> which is really fascinating, of course, because he eventually went to write the book on how to transmute uh, the drudgery within into gold. So um, the calcination process for your assignment was to think of a time when you were extremely embarrassed that you probably don't want to think about, that you want to put in the back of your mind, in the recesses of your um, subconscious, things that you don't ever want to think about because it's just too embarrassing. Um, even as young as three years old, there could be things that you did like peeing in public or peeing in bed that you never told anyone that you didn't, you don't want to tell anyone. It's just too embarrassing. There's tiny little things like that. And you know, there's so many of those moments in our lives that we can transmute if we want to. And I think that the point is that to transmute as many things as you possibly can. Um, so with calcination, we burned our, we burned our embarrassments. <laughs> I have mine right here. And um, Annalisa, I know we talked a little bit about it before we started recording, but do you want to share your calcination this past month? And um, you don't have to give specifics, but just like a rundown on your experience. Yeah, totally. I um, have, I love like thinking about 
that, like the embarrassment thing, and then kind of simplifying it into the emotions of guilt and shame. Like the like whatever we have guilt or shame about, I feel like is a lot of times where we're embarrassed or uncomfortable. Um, like it stems from an insecurity that's usually spawned by some kind of thing where we feel like we're not of value or worthy or something. I don't know. But basically, like I bought a new car this last month and the whole process around buying myself a car and not just a car, but a car that I wanted was very like, it just brought up a lot of shame and guilt issues for me within my dynamic with my husband, things that I felt were projected onto me and my family dynamics with my father. Like I always felt like undeserving of doing those things for myself. Like I always feel like I'm really good at propping other people up for their accomplishments or telling them that they deserve those things. But when it comes to me, like I'll always choose something that I feel like, I always feel like I deserve nothing if that makes sense. I don't have a very strong sense of entitlement. I usually feel kind of the opposite. Even though I still have a really large amount of desire for great things, my worthiness is actually not, it doesn't match my desire. Um, and so there was kind of like this process for me that finally deciding to do this and do it in a way that I wanted, it just kind of activated me having to confront all of those issues in a really direct way but the way that it all happened ended up being a lot more complicated than i thought because it wasn't like i just gained up the courage to walk in there by myself and you know i want this car and walk out and have it be fine i walked out and there was like a whole month's worth of problems that i spent every day of the month of May having to confront and then the day that I bought it I got sick and I came down with the longest cold I've had in probably two years and I then had to confront kind of like that feeling of I also I beat myself up a lot when I get sick because I take responsibility for my health like I'm a super big health nut so when I get sick I'm always like how did this happen and then um so basically I got sick. I was kind of working through these issues of guilt and shame around this car purchase, especially since it was having problems. And I was dealing with like, you know, we were talking about temper tantrums. I had so many temper tantrums during that time. Like I would get finally over a hump and I'd start feeling optimistic again. And then I'd get a phone call that there was more problems with the car or like I'd have some really bad day at work while I was sick. And I had, a, I lost my voice. I also like my throat chakra and like my actual throat was completely blocked. So I couldn't even express the emotions that I wanted to express in the way that I wanted to express them. Cause I was like literally being choked out by the sickness. So it was just like crazy. I felt insane and I didn't give up. Like I just kept like the longer I kept having to fight for what I wanted, the more I started to feel worthy of it. And I could see that like all of these issues that I was having around the guilt and shame were starting to completely go away. And it was through my anger and frustration that they started to go away. And then I started, and there was a woman that was helping me through this process and she was advocating for me. She was like, no, we're women and we can't get taken advantage of. Like you got to fight for this. Like you deserve this. And that was really cool. And so, and my husband was really supportive of me. And so it was kind of like this process where through all me having to stick it out and feeling just completely knocked down, I actually gained empowerment and a voice. And then as things started to kind of get over that hump a little bit, I did my calcination ritual on the Scorpio full moon because I just felt like at that point, like I just needed to do it on that day. And it was raining that day. So I collected water for our dissolution ritual too. So I have that water, but I did, I did my ritual a little bit different. I didn't do it exactly the way that we had planned just because um, there's this ritual that my teacher taught me that includes a vision board. And it was just like, I felt like I needed to combine the rituals together and create this vision board. So I did the meditation and the breath of fire um, but I also did the Dakini ritual that she taught me. And then I spent the entire day of that full moon vision boarding and just 
um, the whole process of that ritual has a very dissolution type effect um, and calcination type effect. Like you're essentially surrendering to the cardinal directions, the goddesses associated with the cardinal directions, and you're asking them to replace all of your shadow like qualities with the light aspect. And you're, you know, you're meditating and communicating with them to do that. And every time I do it, I feel immediately renewed. I feel super healed. And it's all, it's always been a very powerful experience for me when I do that meditation and I do it with ritual a lot, but I don't do the vision boarding. I'm only, this is only the third time I've done the vision boarding and literally within three days, four days of me doing that vision board, it was like everything just completely flipped and started getting better. It was like that weird bad luck stretch just was completely gone. I started, my sickness started going away. Um, my, uh, car stuff all got sorted out and I just felt like at the end when I went and got the car and wasn't sick anymore and then actually I ended up in the ER after that so I went to the ER um I had it was interesting because he talks in this book about something that happened to him with his spine in one of these two chapters it's either the calcination one or the um it was calcination I think he talks about um something that happened in his back and I just thought it was so crazy when I read that because, or no, it was dissolution. I don't remember. It was one of these. He talks about his back. And I read that after my ER trip. So I was just kind of crazy. But basically what happened was I went to bed and I started getting some of my normal back pain, but it was a little bit different. And I laid on my acupressure mat and I was starting to get better at this point. Like my cold was kind of starting to go away. And I laid on my acupressure mat because it usually gets rid of the pain. And it did. I felt great. And I took the acupressure mat away. And then this like small, like central pain in the middle of my back just started getting wider and wider and wider. Like it just started wrapping around. And then it was kind of all in this front center area. And I couldn't tell if it was inside or like outside and it just progressively got worse. And it felt like something was like trying to claw its way out of my cavity in this area. And I spent three and a half hours trying to get it to go away. Like I showered, I meditated, I rolled around, I stretched. I even went and jogged up the hill. On, uh, it was midnight. I went and jogged up the hill and was like thinking of like Kundalini energy, like trying to get the like electricity of my nerves and my spine to like move up and out because it felt like a blockage. I could feel it all stuck there. And that was when I had to sit and kind of, go okay I have to go to the ER like it's not going away and I had to kind of confront the fact that I might miss my sister's graduation at the end of the week that I was going to I was getting on a plane which is also another fear of mine it was at the end of the week I was supposed to go to her graduation I work I just got this car that was like a huge loan and then if I go to the ER I'm taking on more money so it was like this whole thing I was facing and I just had to advocate for myself go to the ER they totally took care of me. They said I probably slipped a disc while, you know, I was doing something and that I just had to rest. And I went back to work the next day, got on a plane at the end of the month and just like managed the pain with pain medication and then read the dissolution chapter and just saw my whole month kind of from this scope of like, holy cow, like that was crazy, you know? Um, it just felt like in an esoteric sense of how the body materializes things that we're working through I just could relate to everything in a very direct way with what happened and mm -hmm. uh, and for yeah. you part of admitting almost like defeat from your own body and having to ask especially being a healer and an energy worker tarot reader astrologer you know like in the healing field to have to let go of your ego and go to a Western medicine doctor and be like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and I was just sitting there like, why? <laughs> like, you don't understand. I do all that, you know, they're like, I don't know. It still doesn't matter. It still doesn't matter. That's still a part of the, the, you know, humiliation and failure, which is a really great example of how it can be different for everybody, mm -hmm. and how it can be, manifest either on the physical level emotional level or material level in some way i mean i feel like looking back on my own life 
experiencing multiple different types of calcination experiences like physical was one really big one for me for sure but it was directly tied to all like a slew of emotional mm -hmm. ones and um like for me i had really horrible eczema when i was younger and still kind of but really not anymore which is amazing so bad that i couldn't even move my neck or take a shower without being in pain because I would have just like, I'd wake up with scratch marks on my back, like the devil like was attacking me. It looked demonic really at that time. And that definitely was a calcination period for me where it was so humiliating to be in public. I was embarrassed to be seen. I didn't want to, I just wanted to not exist. And um, I think to now though, cause that actually wasn't that long ago for me. I would say the last eczema flare up I've had was like actually before I started doing astrology full time. Um, I quit my full time job. I was like, I gotta like, I really have to nail this down cause it's, I just need to get everything out of my system, do a full detox, like clean myself, get really in my spiritual path. And it, ha and it has gone away since then. And I don't use steroid creams or anything. And I've started eating the foods that were triggering it before, which is amazing. But now it's, it's almost like that calcination has evolved into emotional calcination for me where that embarrassment is get, coming to another level of being seen existing <laughs> having temper tantrums um i really do equate eczema with having a lot of heat mm -hmm. in the body like it's inflammation and it's almost like you're it's trying to get out of you in some way and it just permeates through the skin um but for me, the last month, I had a really embarrassing moment <laughs> where I have, um, I've been, now I've been suffering from PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoria disorder. And it just creates basically phantom symptoms of severe depression to the point where it feels like I'm bipolar. Because right when my period hits, I'll be totally fine. Like, I will have gone from crying, screaming, like blue in the face, angry, like at the world, everyone around me, letting it out and everybody to like getting my period and then going out and being fine, <laughs> like in one day. Um, and so I, with that Mars and Cancer really affected the expression of that anger. <laughs> and I just started screaming like crazy so intensely that I'm pretty sure that my neighbors heard me. And I was really embarrassed by it because I was like, oh my God, they all heard me. They think I'm crazy. And they're all men that live around me. Um, also, it was like my full moon in Scorpio ceremony was about essentially balancing the masculine and feminine, allowing women to exist in their full form, whether it be ugly or beautiful and not feel like we need to suppress ourselves. And so I had that really extreme outburst. And for a few days, I did not even want to go outside or like be seen by my neighbors. Like, oh my God, what are they thinking? But then after thinking about it, it was like, that felt really good though. It felt really good to scream obscenities at the top of my lungs so that all these men actually living around me that are bothering me can hear it. And after that though, it felt great. I was like, you know what? Maybe I do need to scream more often. That's it. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I mean, I feel like I relate to that a lot with how my stuff felt just because my issue my insecurity last month really was stemmed around how I'm viewed by men in authoritative roles mm -hmm. like the dealership that I had to go and like 
confront, you know, I felt like I was going to be treated badly because I was a young woman with tattoos and they treated me really well. But then when all of those problems happened, I was like, they fucking did fuck me over. Like they were nice to me, but they totally tried to pull one over on me. And one of the guys that tried to pull one over on me, I ended up totally chewing his ass out. And I went off on him for like a half an hour. And I even had like this whole like I had a, a spiritual conversation with him about integrity and like woo shit. And I was like, I, this is a learning experience for you. It's definitely a learning experience for me. And this is not okay. Like you need to stop feeling okay, fucking people over this way. And basically because I stuck it out with them, but also was like no fucking bullshit. I ended up walking away with everything I wanted didn't have to pay a cent for $2,000 worth of work that had to get done on the car. And they even had to renegotiate my contract to like accommodate everything. And it was better than the original one that they gave me. And everybody was in such fear of me after that, that I felt so fucking good about myself. And I drove off in that car and I was like the person that I was at the beginning of this process is not the same person that I am after that. And I've always known that I have that in me because I've done it in various parts of my life. Like I know it's that that person is there to pull from, but I think it's that whole thing of like walking through the fire. It's like, you might know who you are internally, but it's not until you've actually walked through the fire and come out on the other side that you actually are the calcined person like he talks about. And so I feel like for you, like when I first started talking to you and met you, I remember there you were working through some of that Mars Scorpio stuff. And I was like, you, it sounds like you need to go shoot some guns or something. And you know what I mean? Like my response is very much like, it sounds like you just need to like let that anger out. And part of me is like, I'm with an Aries Scorpio moon and he processes through anger constantly and not in an abusive way, not in a way that is um, unhealthy, I think to an extent, some of it sometimes can be, but I think having somebody that uses anger as a tool to create and advance in themselves has been really empowering for me because I've always been the opposite and maybe your Libra nature can relate where you're always trying to be more compassionate or harmonious or passive, you know, like keep the peace. And then sometimes it's like, no, like keeping the peace isn't the answer. It's like yelling at somebody and chewing their ass out and saying like, look, dude, like I'm pretty chill when you don't piss me off but like don't fucking piss me off or try to take advantage of me like because then the she devil is going to come out and that's why i like doing that dakini ritual too because the wrathful dakinis and buddhism are they're the feminine wisdom and they are there to like fuck shit up and say like you know here's the ugliness and here's the truth like you might be trying to walk this eightfold path and be all monastic and perfect but the reality is is that we all have ugliness in us and like we have to confront those things and work through it and that's like the shadow dissolution self and I feel like it there's always a time and a place for that and I think it's so cool that you and I had such a, different experiences but had to like through anger and like releasing of this like she you know she wrath or like whatever you know like against men too like having that like because I think women like we do have so much like we just anticipate how we're getting viewed right as like stupid or crazy or not worthy or even my neighbor across the street when I came home with my car the first week before all this stuff happened she was like oh did your husband buy you a new car and she's a lesbian and I like couldn't believe that she said that to me you know and I was just like no I bought myself this car and I was just like fuck you you know what I mean like I know she didn't mean it in a negative way but I remember feeling like that's my trigger like that's everything that I get frustrated with and after yeah after this month it's not so much that I don't still have that chip on my shoulder but I don't have the fear tied to that chip on the shoulder for who I am and advocating for myself in those environments. I have more of this kind of like, oh, you better watch out kind of feeling, you know, which is like what with your 
neighbors, you know? It's like, yeah, hell yeah, they should fear you, you know? Become queen bitch of the block. That's how I feel, like, run that block, you know? This is your town. It's like Old West, like, taking it back. Mm hmm So he relates the, he's, so Dennis William Hawk relates these processes to tarot here and there. And so I pulled out the wands card and the emperor that he talks about, but he calls it, what does he call it? He calls it, I don't know. I'm using the Thoth deck. So yeah. it, um, the emperor, which is uh, just like surrounded by red, <laughs> red, but he's sitting there calmly. He's surrounded by ram heads, Aries. Uh, he has the ball that represents spirit and then above it is the cross uh, I forget what this little thing is and then he has a lamb at his foot and the shield that has the phoenix on it and um, he's looking to his right which is the masculine so um, and he has his right leg crossed over his left and so he's very much in his masculine his all of his energy is focused towards the right side and um in this card i mean you guys know tarot more than i do i just know it from this like esoteric perspective but in this card with the symbolism it represents having a control over that flame being in total control of that eruptive uh fiery disruptive sometimes sometimes chaotic spontaneous energy that is fire and he's calm he's sitting very calmly with his shield down even so he's not even in defense he's like yeah i know that i could probably scream profanities at the top of my lungs at you if i wanted but i'm not going to <laughs> because I don't feel to at this moment. And then he brings in the kings and the queens too, which the queen, which I want to talk about because she, all the queens are sitting in the court cards and she has an acorn on her left hand, which represents intuition. Um, and she's she has her head on a or her hand right hand on a panther so the sitting position is the position of the gods in ancient egypt where you're sitting straight with your feet on the ground and your hands are on your lap that's the basic god position but um with these cards they're usually holding something and so it represents how they're utilizing their energy or how they're moving their energy through their being. Um, and with her, she's using intuition, which is another aspect to fire that doesn't really get talked about a whole lot. I think I use the word instinct a little bit more when it comes to fire, because I like to think that intuition is related to the water element, but instinct is like an animal instinct that grow that is just, kind of dormant within you at any given moment that you can call upon um, in times of, you know, fear, anxiety, stress, um, fight, flight type of scenarios. And um, with her holding the acorn staff on her left hand, which is the intuitive feminine receptive side, it means that she's basically receiving um, like knowledge she's being receptive to uh i guess instinctual energy and then with her hand on the panther it's that um feminine more of an instinct it's just a very instinctual card i don't know if you guys have more to add to that no, I love that. I definitely think that, I mean, with my Rider Waite and the Mother Peace, they use a lion and the Mother Peace and a cat mm. in the Rider Waite. And I love that animal instinct uh, comparison because I definitely feel like the Queen of Wands with that. Um, she's a diminished version of the Strength card, the Lust card. So, mm. 
yeah, like our animal nature and our intuitive self that's more spawned from sexuality and creativity and from that more spark, you know, it's our, it's our confidence, it's our power mm-hmm. house. It's not so much like the more ethereal, like you're saying, the water energy, that's a different realm. It's the subconscious. The, we look at the water as inactive, passive, negative, and we look at the fire as active and, you know, pushing out, you know, doing something, creating something. And I feel like her symbology when she's with that cat in those decks is that she is in just like in the strength card she is in flow and in harmony with her wild nature it's in its like height of expression and she's like you were saying you know the emperor he's like i could yell at you i could freak out at you but i'm i'm good i'm just chilling out it's like the queen of wands is like i'm in harmony with my inner lion lioness and you know Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna just flip out on you just to flip out on you but she's in there for sure yeah totally (laughs) reason that she's flipping out on you right now (laughs) and I always identify that car a lot just because of being a leo and having a giant panther tattooed on my stomach it's always like my you know Mm -hmm. my card I get so with the physical and, and psychological expressions of calcination or someone who is not calcified, um, Dennis says that uh, the kind of manifestations of that expression comes out in people who are, um, let's see, because I like when he says how people appear to you in their non-calcified way oh it says before calcination people are stubborn fearful materialistic and neurotic i was very neurotic that day (laughs) (laughs) i felt neurotic for like the whole two months before may it was like a progression of neurosis or something like and then once may hit it was like blasted open like yeah (laughs) yeah and then he says after however people are not worried of ego damage Mm. um, specifically about maintaining a certain lifestyle or how you appear (laughs) to the public (laughs) um because once you've um I guess had a temper tantrum in public. There's going <laughs> back. <laughs> I know you're like my shit's all out there. I was thinking about that. Um, somebody I was talking to it was either my mom or my husband, but we were talking about something like that. And I was just thinking in this conversation too. I remember I had some realization when I was younger that if you have no secrets and everything about you is just out in the open, then you can never be embarrassed. Cause your shit's just always out there. And I just remember like from a really young age, just deciding that I was never going to have any secrets because if I never had secrets, I would never be ashamed or embarrassed. And it's worked for me for the most part. I'm not saying I haven't experienced shame or embarrassment since then. Cause I think the embarrassing moments just happen regardless of secrets. But I, I think of that energy of like, whenever you feel like you're protecting something that you're ashamed of, you know what I mean? Like you don't want people to know about you. Then the pain of the embarrassment is way bigger than if it was out in the open to begin with, you know? Yeah. And then eventually you can laugh at it and then eventually comes the light, the lightness with it. Right. Which is laughter. And, um, but, oh, and then some of the symbolism, um, of calcination too, is depicted with um the symbolism cultural symbolism of calcination includes skulls funeral pyre pyres hell or purgatory torture crucifixion birds rising from flames which is on uh the emperor's shield um and confrontations with ravens imps dragons or devils dream scenarios involve wasting away in a fever being lost in a desert or being eaten alive by a parent uh, or by animals such as the gray wolf 
which is base instinct, or the red lion, the unredeemed person. <laughs> um, My dogs are the barky ones. And then it says, tarot, um, tarot cards are full of alchemical imagery, and the trump card corresponding to calcination is the fool, which, uh, who carries the first matter with him in his knapsack? Does this one have a knapsack? Oh, I guess he does have an, somewhat of a, I think that might be the knapsack full of um, astrological symbols. Oh, I forget about that on the Thoth one. Alchemical engravings at this stage show the king being boiled alive, cremated, or sitting inside a sweat box or sealed retort. Sometimes this phase is represented by the sun and moon roasting over flames. The classic symbol of calcination is the salamander, mm -hmm. which is also depicted in the tarot all over the place. Oh, and then this is probably the salamander that he's talking about right here at the base. And that's because he says that it's probably likely that um, when alchemists were burning things in their cauldron, salamanders would come in because they like the heat from it. And so it became a symbol for calcination due to just that simple so cool. I love environmental it. experience yeah um so oh and then when applied psychologically the element of fire or heightened consciousness is one of the most powerful forces for transformation at our disposal and so one way to, one way to harness that fire um, randomly or just in any moment is by doing the breath of fire which we did for the homework assignment and um, to literally burn shit <laughs> so we burned our our embarrassments all the things that we would never want to see ever again <laughs> never want to experience in the light of day and we have our water some of us um, put our water out for the full moon in Scorpio a month ago um, from the last meeting that we had. If you are not coming to the meetings every week, then you're not getting all the information because that's just how it goes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, this week, now let's get into disillusion because that's the next step in after this whole burning um, burning away of all the embarrassment and everything. Um, I wanted to talk about disillusion this week too, because since we missed uh, the last meeting, I want to go over this and kind of do the exercise together, because I know that we all, do you guys have all of your things? Yeah. With you? Yeah. Okay. You want to do it tonight in this video? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't have mine with me. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I did find out, though, that I cannot do the breath of fire. Oh, interesting. Like, I tried for, like, 25 minutes, and I, my lungs can't do it. Like, I don't know if it's, like, a rhythm thing or, hmm. I don't know. I just couldn't do it. And then I got a really... Have you done breath work before or do you do breathing exercises? Yeah, but not not rapid breath mm. exercises. They're mm -hmm. all very mellow and like calm down. And um, I've done like Kundalini a couple times, haven't resonated with it. So mm -hmm. I know that's, you know, a piece of it, but it was just really, really hard. And then I got um, a huge migraine that lasted mm -hmm. for like, 13 hours after I did that and I was like dude like that that's crazy so I don't know if maybe I should go to the doctor and see if I have asthma or something <laughs> but like I, I mean it's not all that kind of stuff isn't like for me every meditation yoga breath work thing I've done in the beginning sucked like hardcore sucked I hated yoga the first time I did it it screwed up my entire body for like a week afterwards meditation hated it for months it took me like a whole month of doing like 10 minute challenges before I started doing it so yeah I would just say that whenever you are doing something that's part of those like ancient lineages for the first time it yeah. 
up like all of the blockages that you have in those parts of your body and the more blocked you are and the less engaged in whatever that thing represents the worse it feels so the fact that that happened to you and you got a migraine is actually probably really good like something no, I was so <laughs> around. yeah totally and then you can kind of go like whoa okay like that really is something and then I don't think it's ever good like in a lot of those practices they never want you to continue doing it if it hurts or if it's uncomfortable so you usually want to figure out like you know for you you're like oh wow like maybe there's something going on with my lungs and I should get that looked at like you would never want to just like force yourself to keep doing breath of fire or anything so yeah. but that's super cool because I feel like that just like gave you some kind of insight to yourself in some way yeah, the it did. thing is going to be a big part of the exercises. There's always going to be some sort of a breathwork um, relationship to these processes because, um, as it's explained in the book, the content, the connection between your body, your breath, and your consciousness is the like the very very basis of becoming one with yourself and becoming true to your nature. And so the first time that I ever did breath work, so there's one breath uh, exercise that you can do called the fourfold breath, which is something I've recently learned where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, you exhale, and then you hold that as well. And what the reason why that is really fascinating is because you can also connect it to the phases of the moon. Um, in your mind, you can do visualizations with the phases of the moon that way. And then you can sync up the parts of your breath that are you're having difficulties with. Um, like if it's hard to exhale for four seconds, that's, you know, an indication that there's maybe difficulty letting go. Um, if it's hard to exhale and then hold, it may be difficult to withhold yourself from breath or just like that lack of air is a psychological experience also or holding it breathing in is usually the easiest or holding the breath that you have in could be hard for some people maybe of like holding on to things maybe it is hard for some people to hold on and then also just noticing where it is is it in your shoulders is your breath only in your chest is your breath only in your stomach where does it go and then what part of the breath is shallow and so that's why that exercise is really great and i actually recommend that one over the one that's recommended in the book especially for people who don't who haven't done breath work for very long because the one that he does in the book is kind of intense in my opinion um, because it's like a hold in for like breathe in for 14 seconds or something and then exhale for 16. Like I can't even do that. But, um, the fourfold breath is a, um, a classic breathing expression that you can sync up with cycles very easily too. Um, so moving on to disillusion, now that we have our burned, calcified parts of ourselves um, in our cauldron, we're going to be mixing that, we're going to be adding the element of water with that, um, going to the second stanza, which is the moon is the moon, its mother. And the moon, its mother um, takes us to a place in our transformation period where we really go to the depths of the emotional parts of what has been calcified. Um, the disillusion period is that is exactly that. We're becoming disillusioned from our illusions that we've been placing onto our egos. Um, the lies that we've been telling ourselves, the illusions or fantasies that we've been chasing or creating in order to uphold an image, all very Piscean exp expressions. Um, he connects this process with cancer, even though he even says the two fish swimming. I mean, cancer, cancer, the cancer glyph is two fish swimming in opposite directions, but also the Pisces glyph is the two um, crescents going in opposite directions as well and um, everything I was explaining felt very Piscean to me which is going to into the depths of your subconscious 
um, unearthing what is an illusion, images that you've been creating for yourself that don't aren't based in a re realistic version of who you are. Um, the purpose from the book, it says, the purpose is to reveal what we try most to conceal, our souls. <clears throat> to expose the, expose the soul requires letting go of control, breaking habits, allowing feelings to flow, and not hiding from emotions. Those buried emotions include our deepest pains and our greatest fears, and that powerful combination can produce some frightful monsters. Yet all the monsters confronted from disillusion are illusions, product, products of our own mental landscape. And this is so important that I feel like a lot of people get stuck here in the disillusion process because your, your illusions can be so strong. And this is where I think that we come to know how strong our intuition and our minds really are. Because once you've broken off that illusion of self, it's almost impossible to think that you were ever under the spell of the ego to begin with. It's almost like going through amnesia or having this experience of like, you know, when you come out of a, let's say for a really great example is being in an abusive relationship. When you're in an abusive relationship, you don't realize that you're being abused. You don't realize that the balance is off. You don't realize all these things because you've been telling yourself, um, you've been rationalizing everything. And when you come out of the abusive relationship, you look back and you think, oh my gosh, how could I ever have let that person manipulate me or say that? How could I have believed all those things? And it's really because the ego was holding on to something during that period. Um, the, there's a couple of meditations that he brings up for this process. One is called the Brain Marie Meditation, and the other one is called the Cybation Meditation. The Brain Marie Meditation is uh, focusing the inhale on, so, you're, so you get into a meditative state, and then you, on the inhale, you focus that energy on parts of your body where you're having issues, or where, you know, from your own personal experiences, where you're experiencing pain, or wherever this would i think require a little bit of knowledge and chakras and um having already done a little bit of energy work with yourself to kind of know where these things are if you've never done it before um but what was i going to say um and the salvation meditation is a little bit more intense where you focus on the parts of the psyche that are most driest and crystallized. Um, so referring to moments that like, why am I so stubborn about my dad or something? So then you think about why I'm so stubborn about my dad. I'm so stubborn about my dad. You just go deep, deep, deep until you figure out what the point of that stubbornness came from. And then essentially you just cry your eyes out. <laughs> so crying is, um, another great way of dissolving the problems or dissolving what we've been calcifying. Um, so another part of the disillusion process is kind of dissolving the ego. And so one of the practices or exercises that I wanted us to do, which might not be really conducive to this platform at the moment, but I'll, it'll, it'll be a good exercise to do on your own, which is the disillusion of self is what I'm calling it, where you say your name, you chant your name over and over and over and over and over <laughs> until it means nothing anymore. Um, it's an interesting concept to consider when we, when we understand that your name, there's actually a chemical reaction that happens to you when you hear your own name. Um, <clears throat> you get a little bit of a serotonin boost whenever you hear your name. You, you identify with 
that energy pattern so much so that hearing your name out loud somewhere kind of creates like builds up the self the container of who you are and um so to say it over and over and over again until it doesn't mean anything is um i hope not damaging <laughs> but hopefully it'll it, it's a really introspective experience for yourself and connecting with your one first identity signifier which was your name as the first thing that separated you from who you were as an individual everyone said it constantly to you it was the word that you heard all over and over and over um so that's one thing that i suggest doing outside of here but for this process i'd like to do a grounding meditation a guided grounding meditation for us um and you know i think i'll end with that let's talk a little bit more about dissolution first um and then we'll end with the me guided meditation and then we'll do the pouring the water into your cauldron and then we'll talk about the next step and then leave it at that so um going back to how dennis is breaking up these processes i like how he shows how it manifests psychologically and then how it looks after someone has gone through that process and so for people who are not dissolved and i think this thing kept coming up too when i was reading this like so he says people who are not dissolved appear greedy judgmental excessive selfish in relationships and tend to but they tend to shine in social situations i think it's interesting to note that you won't be all of these things it doesn't mean that you are greedy and judgmental and excessive and selfish in relationships it just means that these are tendencies that pop out pertaining to the specific thing that you're trying to dissolve it doesn't mean that because you show greediness like in different areas of your life that it's like bad that you shouldn't do it ever and that you should feel guilty about it it just shows a tendency where you're holding on to something and i hope that makes sense and i i don't think it's like so cut and dry too i think that i mean yes we've been around older people who have been totally crystallized to the point where like they don't let any new ideologies into their existence they're very judgmental of the people and um groups of people around them um they do appear greedy and things like that but it's 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 a it's a level of greediness it's a level of judgment it's not like you're a judgmental person it just means that in this specific area you can be judgmental and so that's one thing that i thought was important to note because a lot of people that are doing this book reading with us are um on the path already and i don't want anyone to think that like oh no i'm judgmental it means i have to like calcify this like over and over and over and over and just like beat yourself up over it um Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. And then as, you know, energy healers, we'll have like little inklings of these pop into the way we act around other people in our, uh, in our world. However, it just, doesn't, it just doesn't solidify you as a person. That's all I'm saying. Like you're not a judgmental person. Um, okay, so through this process, the belief, your belief systems are being overhauled and psychological projections are getting worked through. So projection, reflection, water. Think of how water was the original reflective pool. There was the like water gazing, what is a, um, is a intuitive practice or looking into the water to see your reflection. They didn't have mirrors back then. And so looking into a body of water to see your reflection was like one of the ways of seeing yourself. Um, 
And that's putting a mirror up to you and really looking at your own self without makeup, without the like glitter, without the projections that you put inside your mind that you've been thinking you look like, you know, but you don't actually look that way. Or maybe you look better than you thought you did. Um, the result of the dissolution process is to release, is the release of pent up energy previously spent supporting the false identity. A dissolved expression is wonderfully flowing presence, free of inhibitions, prejudgments, and rigid mental structures. Um, so, as a question to you guys, just as a reflective exercise, <laughs> um, what are some judgments that you had when you were younger that you've now at this point we're like oh my gosh i can't believe i thought that way <laughs> you want me to go first yeah all right <laughs> um i i'm trying to think i think like my biggest judgment when i was younger was that i thought you had to be like the most famous person in the world to matter. Like that's a very Leo thing. I feel like I was just like, if you're not at the top and influencing like the entirety of the consciousness of the world with your message, then there's no point in being alive like at all. And I just basically, I had this just viewpoint that if I didn't make it to where I was remembered, by humanity in some way that there was no point for me to be alive in this world and my calcination dissolution of like that process when I was younger and I basically made a choice to not stay on that path based off of the people that were reflecting how terrible your and obviously not everybody's journey is this way. I obviously look to my nodes and my chart is why my journey unfolded the way that it did. But I basically, when I was a teenager and was on the road to like fulfilling those dreams, I was surrounded by so many people that were just expressing those same desires in such a horrible way that I saw what I and myself was becoming in that way. And it was like, oh wow, like this is terrible. Like this has nothing to do with my value system. And this is all for all the wrong reasons. And I removed myself from that situation. And it was really difficult because I basically had to completely let go of what I valued about being alive and had to find meaning and purpose in my life again in a way that my rational mind could say like, well, of course, like there's all these higher minded things where like you can live a simple life. But I really thought I was special and not here to just, you know, go through the motions. Like I thought I was here to do something really really big in like this really big way. And so when I started feeling an adverse reaction to that and had to learn kind of like the opposing part of that it was really and this was pre-astrology pre-esoteric knowledge like this was all just like dark night of the soul shit that I didn't really I did have spiritual stuff I was doing like I was reading Pima Chodron's The Places That Scare You I don't know if you guys have ever read that but it's um she's a really popular Buddhist author and I bought that book actually right around that time where I was just like drowning in fear of life. And I found this little like pocket size of that book. And it was what kind of forced me to have to face my internal walls that I had built up that had created those judgments and those fears and that kind of prison that I was in. So yeah, I feel like that was kind of like the beginning step that led eventually led me to where I'm at now, but that was like 10 years ago, 11 years ago. <laughs> like, I feel like it's taken me that long to kind of let go and separate from spending most of my youth viewing the world of like, you only matter if you're like at the top, you know? It's a big one. <laughs> Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> um, lately, 
Okay, what about you? Judgments against any people, groups, ideology? Uh, <laughs> Everything, all of the above. Um, Cap Capricorn Rising, super judge. Um, yeah, I think the biggest one for me that impacted my life the most was having a judgment that depression wasn't real and that people could control it with their minds and you just had to be happy you just had to think positive thoughts and like it's it's all in your head um and that was before I had depression and way before tarot and all this stuff came into my life but I remember I had posted something on tumblr which should tell you how long ago this was um about I've never had depression. I don't understand how people can be depressed. Like, why can't you just get up and go about your day? Um, you know, just wake up and think positive. And, you know, I made like this little post about that. And one of my friends who's still my friend at the time, I remember she like reblogged it or whatever you do on Tumblr and was like, I can't believe you've never had depression before. Like I've had depression my whole life and it's weird to me that someone in life has never had that. Like, you're really lucky. That's really crazy. She didn't try to, like, judge me or say, like, you're wrong. Like, that's not how this worked. Like, she didn't do any of that. She was just like, wow, I, I can't believe that you've never experienced it. That's crazy. Like, she didn't try to fight me at all. Um, and she totally had the right to. I was being really arrogant and, like, not understanding people's journey or story or anything um and I mean maybe that was like me shouldn't have written that out because like within a year I think was when I got my crazy massive like dark night of the soul um depression came out of nowhere for no reason like I had just gotten promoted I had an amazing boyfriend great house great car everything was perfect and I was super fucking depressed um and that's just always I don't think I've even ever really reached back out to her and said like hey I'm really sorry for being you know naive back then and like posting those judgments and because a lot of people no surprise I had a big following on tumblr like everywhere I fucking go on the internet people come to me but I I made these big judgments and a lot of my followers had depression and like it was like calling them out it, it was just really rude of me <laughs> um and I don't think I'd ever followed back up with her and let her know like that I was sorry for saying that because like I didn't think about how it would affect people human beings let alone people that were in my life because on the internet it's so easy to be anonymous or like bigger than you actually are and um I just never really thought of the consequences of like what if somebody that is close to me saw that so I just feel like I never even really discussed that with her and we've had so many conversations about depression and um she actually found out that she was being diagnosed for manic depression but she actually had dissociative identity disorder and when you try to give medication for um manic depression but you actually have did it it increases did so she was getting the wrong medication for years and none of it was her fault and you know some people's brains are just wired that way some people have traumatic experiences some people experience past life shit that's attached to us you know so mm -hmm. it was just a I don't regret much in my life because I think everything's a lesson, but I wish I just would have handled that more tactfully. And I wish I would have understood that depression can get anyone, no matter how good your life is. Does it matter if you're, I mean, look at all the celebrities that have killed themselves in the past five years. Like it doesn't matter how famous you are, how rich you are, how happy you are, or you can project yourself. Um, it's a, it's a real problem. And I didn't understand that until having gone through it myself. So yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Yeah, I have a lot of little judgments. I think I was super judgmental when I was younger and slowly getting up. Actually, I'm at least at a point where I could acknowledge that I'm being judgmental and then stop it. Um, but however, I think my most recent one that I'm getting over right now is being judgmental against like nerdy Magic the Gathering people <laughs> because <laughs> I've started going to these monthly magic meetings and I'm calling it magic the gatherings and I'm like oh my god <laughs> I am one of those now I I am I'm learning magic for the K and like it's actually really fucking cool and I get it now and um we probably would have been really good friends had I been not uh, not so judgmental about <laughs> that lifestyle and that ideology and thought process um yeah so that's my reason I have a ton but that's like a really simple one um <clears throat> one thing that I thought would also be a really great exercise for conscious um every day kind of like just solidifying the subconscious work with the consciousness in our everyday mundane life um, for things like judgment like I remember going through a really big period in my life where I was consciously catching myself at the grocery store like oh my god I just judged that person oh my god I just made a quick reaction oh my god I just like criticized something about that person in my head and it's definitely to no fault of anyone's, but really it just comes out as being like the way that I see it. If your external is also your internal and vice versa, then with all those judgments going out, it's all your mind is creating that experience for you. And so really you're just living with your own judgments and being a judgmental person, you're feeling it. You're, you're just feeling it yourself and creating it for yourself. And so it's not like, you're getting getting anything from it if anything you're solidifying that negative energy within you and it's probably a reflection of how judgmental you are on your own self and so when you're judgmental on of other people before they can be judgmental back then you're like one-upping them <laughs> um because you probably think that there's a lot that could be judged about you too I also want to add to that when we were talking earlier with the cancer um, eclipse and how that's relating to parental dynamics. Um, you bringing that up was really poignant for me and actually just unlock, like I just remembered so much about who I was when I was younger that I feel like is similar to Lacey and you in that way of like just shitty ways that I thought about people. And I can relate all of my views to my parents, like all of them, my weight issues and how I viewed myself and others. And my mom was, my mom's a Virgo and she's super judgmental, like no shame though about it. Like she owns her judgments to a point that was negative for me growing up. And then my dad's very arrogant and his judgments too. And so I wonder, I think like you talking about that and us talking about the cancer eclipse and dissolution judgment and then Jupiter being in Sag, which is judgment, you know, um, I think that meditating on the root of where those judgments came from is what you're getting at. And then in the dissolution process, we're kind of reflecting on that, but maybe you're speaking to it more directly of just like, if you've had a judgment you know, or you're having judgments, instead of just acknowledging that you're being judgmental, acknowledge when the judgment was formed. And I think that that has changed my life. Like when I, I was such an asshole, I remember when I was younger, because I just, I was bullied. And so when I started bullying back, I had no hard feelings about it. Because to me, it was just like, okay, well, it's a dog eat dog world. Like I was treated this way. So I'm going to treat whoever I want that way. I've gone through like phases when I was younger. And now I don't feel like there's any part of myself that would ever bully anybody again. Like I don't identify with that person at all anymore. When I get around my parents kind of doing their stuff, it triggers that side of myself and those memories I have of when I bullied as a coping mechanism or as a survival instinct. And, um, there's just a lot of people like the way you feel about your friend, like wanting to make amends or something or kind of 
like I wish I would have handled that differently. There's so many people that have known me throughout my life that have seen like the worst of me, you know, and it's like, I'm so not that person anymore, but I remember her really well. And sometimes she comes back up to like resurface and it's, I feel so much better being in a place where I know like why she comes up and I can look at it as, oh, that's a trigger for me in this moment. What's getting triggered versus just falling into the pattern of the judgment because it was just hardwired, if that makes sense. Totally. And that, that, that also speaks to this, what I've been realizing throughout reading this is that there's different levels that everyone is at in their experience with these things. Like you're at a level where you're able to associate it with a trigger and then follow the rabbit hole down, transmute it, move on. Some people still need to get to a point where they're actually becoming aware of these thoughts. And so um, that is a really great tool for people. Like what you just said is a great tool for people who are beyond becoming aware of those thoughts um, and which will most likely be children of alcoholic parents, healers, um, people who do energy work because at a very young age, we were taught to be hyper aware of ourselves and ourselves around other people and how other people are affecting us. And um, I'm pretty sure that's in this chapter um, where, oh, oh, it's in the, oh, sorry, it's in the separation chapter, but um, in the separation chapter, I think this might also be prevalent, so I'm going to read it. He writes, the purpose of separation is the classification analysis of previously hidden material by the rational mind to extract a person's essence. In human terms, that recovered material consists of the charred remains of ego from calcination and the repressed memories and emotions released during dissolution. Somewhere in that mass of confusion lies the spark of the true self dissecting and discarding what is no longer relevant or useful in the important goal of the separation process. It requires a sharp and decisive will since many of the suspended elements have a sticky residue of ego or emotion tied to them. On the personal level, we all know how difficult it can be to let go of destructive habits and behavior patterns. The message here is that only by living on the razor's edge can we get by can get beyond the viewpoint of ego and perceive both sides of reality. And so that's the next step is deciphering between what is a tool and what is a hindrance um, for the dissolution process. The um, yeah, for the dissolution process, you're becoming aware of these things. And so one thing for people who have a hard time doing that can do is like make going to the grocery store your time of meditation. From the moment that you leave your house, get into your car, go to the grocery store and come back. I always use that as an analogy because it's been my biggest tool for seeing how my inner world is being reflected back to me because these are all mundane interactions that you're having with people that have nothing to do with you. None of these people at the grocery store give a fuck about you. Like they don't care about you. And so everything that you subconsciously think about the people you see, the people you interact with, it's almost like a, it's a good, it's like how labyrinths were supposed to be used, right? Like you go through a labyrinth and you, you come upon someone who's walking towards you. Like, what do you, what's your reaction? That's the most important part. What do you decide to do? Do you decide to talk to them, nod, say hi, smile, look away, don't make eye contact, keep going, stop, don't stop. That's all a reflection on you, not the other person, not what they're thinking, not what they're doing. Um, and so 
going to the grocery store is can be one of the most like helpful tools in this disillusion process for just becoming aware of your judgments and the quick reactions that you have towards people external from you. Um, that's the reflection process. I love that because I've actually experienced like that specific example of the grocery store. Like mm -hmm. the grocery store in my neighborhood, the relationship that I have to it at, like eight years later with who I am today versus when we first moved, how I internalized and behaved is like night and day. And then I started doing that work when I first started doing witchcraft. I started kind of testing out my energetic frequency, even on the highway, like driving and stuff. And my entire relationship to the grocery store and my commuting, like in between going to these mundane places, has totally changed just through the more awareness of the energy that I'm putting out around me. And so I feel like I can totally attest to that being such a like good I just love that you brought that up because I'm like, yes, I relate to that. I've done that in my own life with the grocery store and it works. Yeah. You know, when you go to the grocery store, you have to feed yourself. So you go to the, to the grocery store when you're not feeling your best, when you're sick or your mood is in a, in a funk. And then you can see exactly how your mood is being reflected back to you. Like if the cashier is like, doesn't say hi, doesn't want to engage, like, it's kind of like flippant to you. You're like, shit, I'm giving off the worst energy right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, too, I think one of the things I learned recently about that is, like, my husband and I are so different in how we view the world with our energy, because he doesn't do this work, and I do. And um, I think that, here's an example. So, like, let's say that you listen to this book club and you feel really inspired to change your energy frequency to something more positive and less judgmental at the grocery store. So you get all on this high and you're like, I'm going to go into that store and I'm going to smile and I'm going to wave and I'm going to be nice. And then it's like, nobody else is doing that around you. Like everyone is like frowning or like get out of my way. And it's like, everyone's just go, and that's the energy of the Bay area. Like here, it's so freaking tense and aggro that it's like sometimes no matter how nice you are everyone's just kind of an asshole and so then it can get really discouraging because then you're like okay there's too many assholes and i'm not there's not enough of me trying to do this in the environment for me to bump up against it but that's totally wrong because it's not going to happen overnight you can't decide overnight that just because you had a good attitude that day that your entire world is going to shift within 24 hours. It's almost like you have to go through this whole seven step calcination process of mm -hmm. restructuring what you're talking about, that subtle body, like the energetic frequency of the subtle body, not just the choice. It's almost an egoic choice to think that just by having a good attitude just for that day, that mm -hmm. you're going to be able to be so influential. You know what I mean? And so I think it's like, you actually do have to completely undo your ego and yourself for real before the actual mirror starts to show up. And that's what I've experienced. Because when I first started trying to be more like that, it didn't work at first. Like, and it was really discouraging. And I had to get into a completely different mindset and go, oh, this isn't, this isn't about whether or not this other person is acting the right way. This is about the integrity that I have for myself of what the right way to act is. And I'm not making a decision on how I act based off of some other asshole. I'm deciding on what is mm -hmm. the right way. And then once you kind of start building those relationships with people in your environment, it does eventually. It's a, yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time I was, I went, I, I noticed that happened to the person that I was hanging out with that she was reflecting back like so much gratitude and graciousness and you could just see how people reacting to her were, with her coming from that space of kind of unified love where it's like whoa I want that to be my reality I want people to react that way to me or I not that way but I want to 
I want to give off that energy that allows people to feel comfortable enough to put, let their guard down around me like that. Like we went out, we got ice cream and just being like her bright bubbly self. I'm chatting with the girl that was like ringing us up and she was like, you know what? Take it. It's on me. I was like, what? Like who gives away stuff? Like, like that never happens. I was like, man, that is the power of having, like coming from a genuine place of love and like, like, and exuding that to the people around you. Like they feel it too so much that she wanted to give her free ice cream because <laughs> of that exchange. Um, and so, yeah, that's a really good point. Like it doesn't, it's not like I'm going to be nice and I'm going to say hi to everyone. Therefore they have to say hi back. Yeah. That's, totally. <laughs> that's not how it works. That's definitely from an egoic place. Yeah. And for me, it's not like, I want to be nice to everyone so that they give me free shit. Like that's totally from an egoic place and that's not going to happen. I'm going to be let down and I'm going to be disillusioned by it. Um, so yeah, that's one really great work. Uh, that's one really great way to just strengthen one, your intuition, because in the separation process, then we're learning about becoming, um, it's called second sight, and we'll get into that later, where this example of using the grocery store can actually evolve into the next chapter. So if you guys want to do that, work it, work through it, just do it as an, exa as an experiment. It's just a practice of being aware of yourself too, just being aware of the thoughts you're holding into yourself and how other people are being affected by it. And you can see when other people are not aware of that, people who are like disgruntled, angry, upset, muttering to themselves, like super into their own ego, really despondent, and like no one wants to be around them. <laughs> um, so, okay. The other thing about this dissolution process that Dennis says that's really important is dreams, is dream work. So, I always suggest keeping a dream journal. I never, I never stick with it, but for the homework assignment, I'm going to do it for the next two weeks, write down my dreams, um, because that's actually something that came up for me recently. Um, a few days ago, I have, I've, ha I've been having a reoccurring dream about wolves mm. um, invading my house and being terrified. And it kind of happens in every new house that I move into. Um, and I had that dream again, but this time I've had it maybe like four times now. And this time I was in someone else's house and the wolves came in. Or I knew they were coming. <laughs> and so we were looking, I was going around to each different room, really cool house. It was like this mid century with burnt orange. It was carpet, wood trim. I had, it was so vivid. I could paint the room that we went in, but we went into this room and that was the only room that had a door on it. And I said to my friend, well, let's just hide in here. And she was like, we can't, it's my sister's room. She won't let us. And in my, ma in my mind, I was like, what? There are wolves coming. We could die. How could your sister not let us stay in her room? That's insane. Like, does she not give a shit about you? And then I walked down to the hallway, and then there was a pack of wolves with their baby cubs just walking around. And it was such a subtle kind of psychic energy of, like, don't make noise. Be really calm. Um just exist calmly basically they won't react if you don't react essentially was the message that i was getting in that dream and so i had to be calm i guess it's like how you would feel being confronted with any scary terrifying animal that could kill you is like you have to remain calm or in control 
of yourself in this situation. And then I woke up. Um, so I thought that was really, I was like progress, <laughs> it's progress <laughs> after this whole calcination process. Um, so keep track of your dreams. I know a lot of us already do, but during the disillusion process, dreams are really important because they reflect to you what's happening in your psyche. And um, what he says in his book is that all of the dream figures are for you. So it's not for anyone else. It's not, I mean, sometimes you can have premonitions, of course, if you're at that level of sure, absolutely. However, at this stage, when you're doing dream work like this, like self journaling, it's all you. It's like, don't project your subconscious onto someone else through your dreams. Can I give you a little interpretation just for whoever watches this that I love about yeah. this? Um, and relating it to, to the tarot. So in the moon card of the Rider weight deck, they have the the dog and the wolf. And the wolf is like the untamed and the dog is the tamed. And they have the two howling at the moon to show kind of like our tamed self and our untamed self. And then I always think of, you know, women who run with wolves and how wolves are that archetype of the, you know, untamed feminine and I think like from thinking of the beginning of what we were talking about with your letting your wrath out and then in this it's like we talked about the queen of wands with the cat and I've had a really strong connection with wolf energy since I was really young too and so I feel like it's like you're getting more comfortable with your wild nature with letting your wild nature exist and I feel like your untamed self which is the self that can scream and howl and be loud. And I also almost think that the thing that's happening to you in waking life with the barking doors next or barking dogs next door, I said door, barking dogs next door um, is also a very interesting piece with what you're mm -hmm. going through because, you know, barking dogs are very untamed. Like that's the issue is that they're, going crazy and nobody's managing it they're screaming they're howling you know and then here you are like screaming and howling and like acknowledging you know you're dreaming about this untamed wildness but then your dream is showing you how to be like in sync with it and i think that's so cool i love it i just thought all of that stuff was cool to oh my gosh thank you so much for that i've been kind of trying to find things on the internet about it like okay I know wolves are a certain you know, I know general archetype energy of it but yeah that makes a lot more sense and hearing it you're reflected through you is really helpful that book too I feel like if wolves start coming up a lot or you know any of us women who are dog people hmm. I feel like those stories are so relevant for our journey into unleashing our wild nature and getting under or out from under the oppression of what we've done to ourselves. So I feel like I refer to that book a lot. My grandma had a reoccurring dream that involved wolves and gypsies and she was afraid of it, but she was all, she could never get home. She was always running away from it, but she could never make it back to her house. And I remember thinking, it's like, because you're not supposed to be running in that direction. Like you're supposed to be running towards the wolves and towards the gypsies. Like you're, she's a Libra too. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it is unnatural to think that that's, that's how mind fuckery this whole like journey is where you're like, it's, so subtle the energy is so subtle that you think that that's the whole point right like being a Libra north node Aries I'm supposed to go in that direction but instinctively because of my instincts are probably all screwed up from growing up in very traumatic conditions that like my instinct is the opposite of what it should be yeah. in terms of like becoming 
one with the wolves, seeing them not as a threat, but as an empowering tool and um, merging with that energy rather than being afraid of it. And, you know, like, don't talk, don't be seen, only talk when you're being talked to, um, don't make a sound, don't exist. And then the wolf energy is so, it's just kind of, it's like it, when it comes in to someone who is already self-conscious of existing, then it, it initially is like, the reaction is to retreat away from that really strong energy and be afraid of it. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's my wolf. I love you weren't allowed to go in the one door, the one room with the door. I know. Yeah, I know. Like you can't. You gotta stop hiding. You gotta just like confront it. Mm-hmm. Confront and then, the fear. And you know how when you train dogs too, it's almost similar. Where your intuition is like when it comes to dog training, like your in instinctual reaction is usually like opposite of what you should do yeah. with them, which is to be calm. Mm -hmm. And so. I relate it to that experience too. Like when you walk a dog who's aggressive, like you're not supposed to pull it or like retract. You're supposed to like be more calm and like more loose um, to show that it's okay. So it's yeah. just like a letting go of that tension internally that says that you have to be tense in order to survive. Yeah. Mm hmm. But yeah, so the dreams, your dreams, dreams, dreams. Um, I had another friend who said they worked through some stuff in a dream recently too this week, where they had a reoccurring dream that progressed or evolved in some way. So I wonder if that Mars Pisces um, in the water signs are helping to elevate that like problem solving yeah. in dreams, in dreamland. I had a fish dream um, right before I read this. Well, it was like two weeks before I read this chapter about dissolution. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe it. Like when I read the chapter and then looked and I was like, oh my God, I had that dream. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, I, it was a delayed re reaction because I read the chapter and wasn't thinking about it when I was reading it. And then I was like, wait a minute. And I had to like, I posted the dream on Instagram because I didn't journal it, but I knew I wanted to remember it. So I just posted about it on Instagram. Cause I have a dream journal, but sometimes I just am lazy and I'd rather just, I know I'll reflect on it more if I look at it on social media. And so I, luckily like I could go back to it and see what date it was and then kind of put it in the context of what was happening for me that mm -hmm. week. But, um, I just was very like, you know, moved by the fact that I had such a literal dream in relation to the chapter and it was not, the yin and yang thing I didn't really get in my dream in terms of the opposing fish, but my grandma, who's a Pisces, my other grandma, not my Libra grandma, um, she is basically like in real life, like she can't move her body at all. She's like kind of crippled essentially. Hey you guys, stop. Sorry. My dog. Mm -hmm. Um, but this dream I had was my family was at a lake house. And she was in one of the rooms staying at the lake house. And this woman came that we didn't really know and took her out of bed and like got her down to the lake and turned both of themselves into fish. And the woman that was turning them into fish was silver. They were koi fish. And the woman that was turning them into fish was a silver koi fish. And she turned my grandma into an orange koi fish. And we were all really worried because we were like, you know, at first when she was getting taken out, like my grandma can't walk, she can't do anything. So we're like, why is this lady doing this? And then I realized like, oh my gosh, that's probably so good for her to be in a different body and be able to swim and move in that way. Cause she can't walk, she can't do anything. And I remember just feeling like a lot of gratitude that she was in this fish body. And then after a while where they were swimming, like there was some need to like get grandma back into her like human body. And so I had to go down to the lake and catch them, but they like let me catch them. Like the silver fish jumped into my hands and I just was holding the silver fish and it was so realistic. Like it had such a lucid, like I could feel it. And it was just looking at me in this like submissive way that was very 
like, yes, like it's fine. Like I get that we need, like there's this next step or whatever. And I don't remember ever it, them ever turning back into humans. I just remember that moment. And I remember just thinking it was a really interesting dream. And I was looking at koi fish symbology, but I'm not associating it because I hadn't read this chapter yet. And so then, you know, reading the chapter and seeing the two fish. And I was like, I legit, I literally dreamt about two fish like during this whole thing. And I read about catching a koi fish in a dream is really positive. But usually, like, especially if the koi fish was willing to be caught because they are a symbol of luck usually. And each color of koi fish has a different symbology to it. So I was really relieved because that, because that time was still kind of, I was still kind of suffering during that time, like feeling in a lot of struggle. So that dream kind of also gave me like this uh, nudge to chill out a little bit. Like you, the koi fish let you catch it. So everything's going to be fine. <laughs> like that's how it felt. Yeah. It was cool though. And I thought that was almost like a reminder that your experience inside of your body is not the only experience that there is to be had. Yeah. That you can still, which I think is another part of dissolution that we haven't really talked about, which is the like sickness that comes in dissolution sometimes to the point where you can't, you can't have access to your physical body. And so therefore you're forced into your subconscious in that way. And so that seems parallel to your grandma turning into a fish because she can't use her body, but it's her going into her subconscious self and feeling free there. Because mm -hmm. that's un just as equal of an existence as this waking reality that we're in right now. Totally. Um, so the meditation, um, I guess I wanted to do a grounding meditation really quick before we go into m merging the water and the calcin calcified self. Just really, I'll do it really quick because I know we're getting, um, a little late and yeah, we'll just go right into it. So, uh, Lacey, I know you're busy, but if you can take like five minutes, yeah, so we'll just sit down, close your eyes, take three really deep breaths in. After three really deep breaths throughout the whole breathing process, throughout the whole meditation, practice the fourfold breath. So breathe in, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, exhale, one, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, I lost it, but you keep going. Now visualize at the top of your head a golden rod going down into your skull, into your crown. On the inhale, we're going to bring that golden light into our, into our eye, into our third eye chakra. On the exhale, we move that light down into the throat. On the inhale, we imagine that light growing really bright. On the exhale, we move that light down into the chest. Inhale, imagine a bright white light filling our chest. Exhale, it moves down into our stomach. Inhale, the light grows bigger in our stomach. Exhale, the light moves down into our pelvic bone, pelvic area. Inhale, that light grows really bright down by our pelvic floor. Inhale, we visualize two red coiling strings. Exhale, we dart those two red coiling strings down into the earth. 
Inhale, we imagine those strings going down deeper. Exhale, they get deeper. Inhale, they're locking in to the earth. On the exhale, we move those two red coils up around us to meet that golden rod. And on the exhale, we move it all the way down through our body again. Pump everything through. Same fourfold breath. Sit here for three rotations. All right, did it really quick because this is boot camp. <laughs> I love it. That felt good. Got my root chakra tingling. <laughs> I got my crown a little tingly. My root is just in pain right now. I've had a lot of like weird, um, like not the same pain that I had when I went to the R, but almost like little shadow, like tinges of it this last like 24 hours. And it's been really annoying. Well, we're gonna put the water into <coughs> the parts of ourselves so that we can allow that little, all the little things that are still popping around to merge with our subconscious. And then during the separation process, you'll probably do more of a like tweaking, filtering of everything you went through in the last month. Okay, so we're kind of doing a ritual um, via the internet right now. And although it feels kind of um, subconsciously, it feels kind of not right to do this and then post on the internet i still think it's important that we can do it and just can just keep thinking of your um you know for us who are doing <laughs> protect yourself put a bubble around you um contain the work that you're doing within your space call on your higher power and your highest self um, anyone that you work with, guides, angels, God, Jesus, whatever deity or thing that you resonate with to come in and help you with the disillusion process. We've already gone through a lot of the emotional bouts with what we have burned away. And so we have been working through this already, but this is the physical representation of the unconscious and subconscious experiences with dissolution. The reason why we're doing this is to solidify that which is within is also without. And therefore, by the act of pouring water over a calcified paper, it is symbolic in the physical form of the experience that we're having internally. Okay, so pour, you poured it into your jar already, Annalisa? Is that your jar with the powder in it? That's my ashes with the rainwater. Okay, I guess I'm going to pour mine into the jar too then, because I put, I have these little crystals in there. That's awesome. Oh. That's a good idea. Okay. So there it goes. There it is. It feels powerful doing it. Holding it while you were talking, I closed my eyes and was just kind of like thinking about the ritual I did where the water was collected and the ashes were made. And I definitely could feel a charge in the water, like a vibrational charge with the marriage of the ash and the water. Mm. I'm really sensitive to vib vibrational energy and sometimes I'll when I am not very engaged in my practice and as intentful of a way I won't 
I'll forget that I have those sensitivities and it's it's exciting to me when I feel it because I'm like oh you're still there (laughs) I can still feel you (laughs) you know with us especially we're so logical we can get wrapped up in the logic of everything and like quantifying it rather than feeling it so this is your um disillusionment it's mixing in there and it's getting reflected back to itself. It'll eventually dissolve. And so one of the exercises that I mentioned earlier about chanting your name, um, you'll do it while gazing into your watery ash. So you chant your name. I mean, you'll know how long you want to do it for. That's up to you. Um, And then we're going to keep this in the jar for the separation part, which will be fun. We'll figure out how to do that. Um, So yeah, that's book club. Yay! (laughs) Waiting for this marriage for so long. Right? It's been a while. I've been waiting to do this too. Um, I'm glad we're doing it tonight, though, because that Mars-Neptune trine is exact. It is. It feels like when I was thinking about the astrology with tonight, I just felt like it was so cool that, you know, because we were supposed to meet and we didn't, and the fact that it lined up with tonight just felt like it was, it always has that, like it always feels like it was supposed to happen this way. Mm Mm-hmm. And then the, also not to mention the moon went into Scorpio again. Right. So. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. I totally like had the, I think I included that in the email, like the moon will be in Scorpio, but then even thinking about the full moon water. Like, yeah. I didn't even think about that part. That's super cool. I know. Yeah. You know knows. And That's that, crazy. Mm-hmm. So that's why becoming aware of like, everything around you which comes into the next part, next chapter like discernment now of like connecting dots like oh the my outer world also is a part of my inner world crazy yeah synchronicities start to happen during this process as we've been sharing all night <laughs> um that, he also mentions that in the book, too, that this is kind of a time where you start to notice synchronicities and things adding up, things are starting to align. So, um, yeah, so, the, so next time we'll meet, we'll talk about separation, and it is the stanza, the wind hath carried it in its belly. So we'll be talking about the wind element next which is the birth child of fire and water so now that's it do you guys have anything to add say i'm gonna do my process when i get home tonight so i'm still gonna suck up all these energies (laughs) of course yeah it's all within you (laughs) Mm -hmm. definitely so keep a dream journal just at, at least once go to the grocery store consciously um, and aware of your judgments and what's what you're projecting out. Um, for me, it's when I'm driving. <laughs> that comes out a lot. And do the water gazing, chanting your name. And I think that's it. Oh yeah, there's two meditations too. Um, You can do one or the other. It might inevitably happen, the crying. (laughs) Um, And yeah, that's it. So I would add to that full moon on Monday uh, in Sagittarius. Yeah, it might be like if you're going to do this ritual later, that might be a good time to do it because the dissolution is letting go and full moon to let go. So now that we're on the eve of another full moon, we can kind of maybe line up our stuff with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it'll be in Sagittarius. 
So we're letting, it's judgment right That's there. I was, I was going to like yeah. say it if you didn't say it, but I was thinking like, it's the perfect. It is. Like thing for what we were talking about. Yeah. It's pretty so perfect. So yeah, on the Sagittarian full moon, we'll, we'll be releasing preconceived ideas, I ideologies, judgments, um, philosophies, ways of thought that had been blocking us or had just been habitually trained by our ego to exist. So with that said, have a great full moon to you guys you and too. everyone. I'm going to post this on YouTube, so it'll be there if you want to watch it again. <laughs> and um, yeah, I love you guys. You guys are great. I'll talk to you in two weeks. Yeah. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Love you. <laughs>